So today it's about backtesting algorithmic trading strategies and potential pitfalls. Um, we're very happy to have Ernie Chan today as a presenter. He's uh, the managing member of QTS Capital, a commodity pool operator and a trading advisor. Um, since 1997, Ernie worked for various investment banks like Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Maple. He also worked for hedge funds like Millennium Partners, Maine. Um, he received his PhD in physics from Cornell, and he was member of IBM's Human League Technologies Group before he joined the financial industry. Um, he's also author of two fantastic books about algorithmic trading. You might have heard of them or even um, might have read them already. Um, if not, you should. Uh, the first one is Quantitative Trading, How to Build Your Algor uh, Own Algorithmic Trading Business. And the second one is, is Algorithmic Trading, Winning Strategies and Their Rationale. So that's from my side. Ha happy to have you, Ernie. So take it away from here. I hope the screen share works. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Doug. For inviting me, I'm very excited to uh, you know uh, be able to talk about uh, backtesting and algorithmic trading. The topic that I want to talk about is very basic. It's uh, it's about backtesting and the various ways that you can fail. <laughs> um, so uh, you know I won't uh, you know uh, 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 production of myself since it's been done very well by uh, Dirk. Um, so what is backtesting? Backtesting uh, is basically just feeding historical data to a computerized trading program. Uh, so what comes out would be historical performance uh, instead of live performance that uh, you know we might uh, have to suffer. Um, and but backtesting is really the crucial differentiator between algorithmic trading from discretionary trading. Uh, you cannot backtest a discretionary trading strategy because uh, you know human decisions that can be different every time. You know, humans are not machines. You cannot, uh, you know, if you feed me the same uh, information, I may not react the same way every time. Uh, but backtesting is also different from simulation because uh, the historical data is real. It's not different. Uh, distinction here. Um, there are uh, cases where we might want to feed simulated data into stress testing algorithm, but typically we would just feed in actual historical data instead of uh, a backtesting engine. Um, now, why is it important to uh, backtest strategies for algorithmic traders? Um, if we are to develop a strategy from scratch, then so it's very obvious because you know how would we know uh, if our brain trial would work uh, without backtesting? You know we don't want to risk real capital on a an idea. Uh, we don't uh, develop a strategy from scratch. We uh, read about it from some somebody else, um, magazines, journals, or talks, uh, and. Uh, so why don't we just immediately go ahead and uh, trade it live? Well, in this case, it is still advisable, even if you have the complete um, details and logic and the performance. You know, it might look great uh, when it was backtested by somebody else, but you still would want to backtest it yourself, not just to confirm, but you want to make sure that you understand and add, replicate every detail of a strategy. You know, whatever is written on paper, you know, may not encapsulate all the details that is necessary to reproduce the results unless you code it up into a program. Well, that this is the first reason. The second reason you want to replicate the strategy, backtest the strategy, is to uh, make sure that they are that the the strategy that was reported does not have backtesting pitfalls that we will talk about later. A lot of times uh, the performance look great on, on, on a backtest uh, basis uh, because they contain these pitfalls and uh, so we want to be fooled by the same pitfalls. Finally, we might have a chance to improve the strategy if we backtest it ourselves. We don't 
want to just trade exactly what other people are trading because that would certainly create a lot of competition. We might be able to make some small tweaks to a strategy to improve it. If not to improve it, just to make it different. Uh, so that uh, you know, not every, not thousands of traders are you know trading, making the same trade at the same time. So that kind of improvement can only be done if you are back testing the strategy yourself, because uh, otherwise you wouldn't know if a modification actually improved things. Okay, so now it's easy to say that we should back test everything that comes your way, but in practice there are too many strategies uh, to backtest. You know, we, we, we would need to ha hire a whole team of 100, 200 researchers if we want to backtest every idea that has ever been published out there or that we come up with ourselves. Uh, it is just not practical to practice everything that comes across our desk. Well, so we need a filter. What is a filter? Is there a filter that we can use to apply to a a strategy that we can say immediately, well, this is not worth our time to backtest. Uh, let's move on. Well, in, in fact, there is such a filter and I'm going to describe some of them. I will give an overview of some of the obvious pitfalls of backtesting and how that can lead, lead us to filtering out some strategies that have these obvious pitfalls and would not be worthwhile for us to backtest. So let's look at one uh, example. Let's say we have a strategy that has an annualized return of 30% and a sharp ratio of 0.7. Uh, well, you know, the annualized return sounds pretty good. Uh, and uh, sharp ratio is not too shabby either. Uh, but it has a maximum drawdown duration of two years and a maximum drawdown of uh, 15%. Okay. So would you backtest it? Let's think about it for a minute. Well, for me, I would not. And the reason uh, is that um, very few trader has the stomach for a strategy that, has, that kept losing for two years. Now, if you are an investor, uh, that's different. Uh, if you are a long-term investor, what's two years? You could have a five years drawdown and that would, you would be unfazed by that. But we are traders. We are talking about quantitative trading and the, um, the really essential idea, goal of, of trading is that we don't like drawdown. If we were to be, uh, if we're okay with drawdown, why, why not just buy the uh, stock market index and buy and hold for 10 years? You probably do better to be to be uh, you know to be quite frank, you would probably do better holding on to the to SPY for 20 years than to put in all this effort to trade in terms of uh, you know analyzed return, right? It's, there's no guarantee that your trading would produce better return than buying and holding SPY. But what trading is supposed to do is that it would reduce both the magnitude of a drawdown and also the duration of a drawdown. So if you're if your trading strategy has a drawdown of two years, one might question why border to trade. And that's not just a matter of preference, but there is also a statistical reason why we don't like um, the strategy that has a, a low sharp ratio and long drawdown. Low sharp ratio indicates that the strategy has low statistical significance. So whatever return that it generates might just be come from luck, right? So. Um, you know, in, you know, if we are students of statistics, we know that we can't just depend on uh, look at the expected um, value of a, a random variable. We need to look at the the error bars, and low sharp ratio indicate that the expected value divided by the error bar is really low, and so it may not be a statistically significant result. The whole back test you can view a back test as really a statistical test of your strategy, and in this case, a low sharp ratio indicate. Uh, any sharp ratio less than one indicate that uh, the statistical significance of your backtest is low. And a long drawdown uh, also presents a problem when we actually trade it live. And the reason uh, is that, you know, when we trade live a strategy, oftentimes we have to decide when the strategy, when, when strategy is losing money, when to turn it off. Right? That's a pretty 
crucial um, skill to have is not only to know uh, when to turn on the strategy, not only to know what strategy to start trading, but also to know what strategy we should turn off. Um, oftentimes, we would decide to turn off a strategy based on whether the drawdown of the strategy, you know, like assuming that we are experiencing a drawdown right now, obviously, if we, if we are, you know, hitting high water marks every day, we would not be thinking of shutting it down. So, assuming that we are in a drawdown, we would have to question, well, is it going to last? Is, is this drawdown going to go on forever or is it going to recover at some point? And the way to decide that is, uh, one way to decide that is to compare your current drawdown duration with the um, the back test drawdown duration, the maximum back drawdown duration in the back test, and if the current drawdown duration is up, you know, longer than the back test maximum drawdown duration, then we can be we we should be quite worried because you know it's clearly the back test is you know not reflecting reality. However, if the back test duration is two years, that means that we would have to suffer at least two years or maybe longer uh, drawdown in order to uh, decide that uh, our real life performance is worse than a back test performance. So that's not so good. You know, you have to lose money for two years before you can decide to shut down a strategy. That's not very practical. That's not very optimal. So if on the other hand, your if your back test draw, maximum drawdown has a very short duration, three months, six months, well then, you know, as long as your real life performance has a drawdown of longer than three months or six months, you can start to worry and you can make a quick decision to start it down. So that's uh, also another reason why a back test, uh, a strategy that has a uh, maximum drawdown duration, you know, of two years would not really make the cut for us uh, and, and we would not bother even to uh, uh, back test it no matter how high the returns uh, look. Okay, so that's um, one filter. Another example uh, would be, um, okay, so let's say some article that you read about describe a high frequency strategy that trade e mini futures and it has a annualized return of 20% and a sharp ratio of 2 uh, and it's, uh, you know, clearly very good. Uh, and uh, its average holding period is 48 minutes. Okay, it was reported. Would you pack test it? Or more importantly, do you have enough information to decide whether to back test it? Well, my answer is we don't actually have enough information and the reason is that we have to figure out if the author included transaction cost uh, and whether the strategy can be implemented using limit or market orders. Uh, in, when we look at, you know, when we read about high frequency strategy, that's is the transaction cost is particularly important. Uh, you know, typically we are unable to backtest a strategy that rely that is market making. Okay, so this is a a, a um, a statement that uh, that might uh, you know might not be familiar to many many people. Uh, you know, we, we many mean mean referring strategies are market making strategy, and they rely on the use of limit orders uh, to uh, to execute to earn the the, the bid ask spread and perhaps more. Um, unfortunately, uh, limit strategies that rely on limit orders cannot be back tested easily. Uh, because you would not know whether they will be filled, uh, the, you know, there, there's, there's a, anybody guess whether your limit orders will be filled. Whereas if your strategy can be executed profitably using a market orders, then it can be backtested quite readily because you know that the market orders will be filled and at what price. So when we are talking about high frequency strategies such as the one I described, uh, there are lots of unknowns. Um, you know, if does it use does it have to be executed with limit orders? If so, forget about the back test. You know, that's it. It's, it's going to be very hard. If it can be executed with market orders and still be profitable, well, yes, then we should go ahead and try it. Uh, furthermore, uh, if um, well, so 
so I mean, in in terms of uh, transaction costs in the in the high frequency strategy, that's the bid ask spread is really usually the main component. The commissions, yes, is important, but it's usually uh, a smaller component of it, and you can easily reduce it by finding a low cost broker, or if you're trading at large volume, uh, you can become a member of the exchange and so forth and, and lower your cost. So those fixed costs, those, those costs that are, you know, created by the broker or the exchange is not not that insurmountable. What's really insurmountable is the bid-ask spread, and uh, so one has to be, you know, very choosy in picking what high frequency strategy to backtest. You know, if they are a limit order strategy, unless you have a great uh, simulator for uh, simulating fields of limit orders, otherwise you can just, uh, you know, move on. You know, we, that would not be the strategy that should be a high on our list of candidates. Okay, so another example would be this. Um, let's say we have a, just a simple buy low sell high strategy. Uh, it advises us to pick 10 low price stock in an index in the beginning of a year and uh, we'll hold them for a year. Okay, so very simple. Just look at the index such as S&P 500 in the beginning of the year. Look for the 10 stock that are really the cheapest. Cheapest not based on any complicated criteria, just the stock price. Okay, it's very, very naive and silly uh, uh, criteria and then hold them for you. And amazingly, this very naive and silly strategy returned 388% in the year 2001. If you don't believe me, uh, try it with that data in 2001. Uh, well, would you backtest this strategy? I mean, it looks so fantastical. What could be wrong? Well, let's see what could be wrong. In this particular strategy, what we have to figure out is uh, whether the data that the DAC test was done on has survivorship bias. Um, you know, and that's something you should be able to find out from reading that paper th that, that described the strategy or asking the author about it. If they did not explicitly tell you that this strategy was uh, performed, this back test was performed on a survivorship bias free database, well, then you don't probably don't need to backtest it because it's just going to waste your time. Uh, a lot of these uh, returns that are so fantastical come from survivorship bias and that we will talk about more a little bit later. But you know, just remember that if you have a long only strategy in particular or any strategy that buy low and sell high, uh, you have to really make sure that the, uh, you know, the, the universe is survivorship bias free. Otherwise, uh, it's going to inflate the backtest result. Okay. So in these examples, um, you know, we talk about some of the biases that are common in backtests and some of and what we can use them as, you know, that, uh, how we can use them as filters to basically save our time from backtesting strategies that have obvious uh, biases. So let's let me um, describe, you know, more how, uh, you know, what kind of biases that are common in backtesting. So there are three kinds that I want to describe. One is look ahead bias, essentially using tomorrow prices to trade today. The second bias uh, would be survivorship bias, something that we just talked about uh, moments ago, uh, backtesting using the current uh, sort universe, but not with a point in time universe or a um, historically accurate universe. And then thirdly, a data snooping bias, which is essentially overfitting uh, to the historical data with a co very complicated model with lots of parameters uh, or trading rules. So all three biases tend to inflate backtests with performance and therefore overestimate live returns. They are very dangerous because they would encourage you to trade the strategy and you would likely actually lose money. Now biases that tend to deflate backtest performance are not as dangerous because all you will decide is let's not trade it. Uh, you might have uh, opportunity cost, you might not uh, make any money, but you would not at least lose money. So these are the prices that are most dangerous that I'm going to uh, describe in some further details. Um, so look ahead bias, let's start with that. Uh, it is actually a very, it's a, a basically a programming bug and it's very, com uh, very common and it happens to the best of us. Uh, 
there are three situations, very, very three examples where it can arise. Uh, let's say, for example, our strategy uses the day's high or low as input to generate a trading signal um, at the market open of that day. Well, obviously, at the market open, we don't, we won't know the high and the low of the day. So that's a very naive, uh, obvious, um, they, you know, look ahead bias, and you know, hopefully, we would not commit that. But the second example is more subtle. Sometimes certain strategy requires us to run a linear regression over some time period in order to determine capital allocation uh, uh, across different uh, uh, instruments. An example would be a pair trading strategy. Oftentimes, if you are trading two stock, you know, Apple versus Google or whatnot, uh, you may not want to just buy one dollar Apple and short one dollar Google. You might say, you know, you want to decide on the optimal uh, uh, hedge ratio, how many shares of Google versus how many shares of Apple to trade. Well, typically we would use a linear regression technique to find this optimal hedge ratio, but remember, if you are using this linear regression to fit Apple versus Google over the entire backtest period, you have committed look-ahead bias, because obviously when we uh, really trade this pair, we would not have that data to run the linear regression. The linear regression has to be done uh, in an earlier period before, in a look back period, before we can use it to form this hat ratio. So this is a little bit more subtle, uh, you know, we, uh, way of introducing look ahead bias. And then finally, it, it, an even subtler uh, form of look ahead bias is optimization of parameters. Uh, if we are, uh, you know, trying to find the best parameter of a trading strategy by optimizing the performance over the entire backtest period, again, that is a look-ahead bias because obviously, before you can enter into that period, you would have, you wouldn't have the data to optimize your parameters. You must optimize the parameters in a in-sample set and then test the strategy in an out-of-sample test. Otherwise, you would be committing. Uh, the most subtle form of a look-ahead bias. So these biases are fairly easy to avoid. You know, just make sure that you do everything um, in the look-back period rather than uh, you know over the period of generating trading signals. But uh, they are you know e you know easy to commit, but also easy to avoid. Okay, that you, um, one way to avoid this look-ahead bias is through the architecture of a automated trading system. Uh, I prefer, you know, we should prefer a, a trading system that can both backtest and trade live. If you are using the same software code to encapsulate the trading logic, and just by a um, turnkey operation, you can turn that program from a backtest program that takes historical data into a live trading program that takes live market data and generate real live, uh, live trading signals, then you can be guaranteed that um, there's no look-ahead bias in that s software that you have created. Because, you know, in live trading, obviously, you, you cannot ask for uh, the, uh, the data ahead of you uh, in order to, let's say, make a, to, to, to optimize parameter. Parameter optimization has to be done using existing data in the past before you can generate trading signal. So the same logic would have been f enforced in your back test, and um, so that's uh, a good way uh, to avoid look ahead bias is to adopt this this practice of using the exact same code for both back tests and live trading. If you can't do that for some reason, well, then one way to check whether your your program has look ahead bias is if you truncate your input data and then check that your positions that your truncated data generates are exactly the same as the position data previously generated up to a truncation point. So this is a little bit subtle, but I'll leave you to ponder it, right? So if cutting off some input data affects the positions before this truncation happened, that means that your position actually depend on data after the truncation point. That clearly indicates a look at bias. Okay, so the final uh, uh, bias is uh, the survivorship. Uh, actually, the second bias that we will drill down into some detail is survivorship bias. I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, 
survivorship bias is using a universe of stocks that have survived until today and ignoring the stocks that have disappeared due to bankruptcy and acquisitions and so forth. So for example, one quick way to see if your data set has uh, survivorship bias is to see if it contains the stock history, the, the, the price history of Lehman Brothers, uh, of uh, Enron and uh, Wellcome, for example. If a, they do have Enron and Wellcome and Lehman Brothers, chances are you have a survivorship bias free database. Now, so go, what's, what's the problem with survivorship bias? Let's go back to our buy low sell high strategy. Again, uh, let's start from a S&P 500 universe or whatever uh, universe that you want to start with, let's say a thousand stock universe. Pick just the 10 cheapest stock based on their price uh, in the beginning of, uh, let's say, 2001, okay? And then sell them at the end of years, this naive strategy. So let's look at our picks in 2011 using a survivorship bias free database. So this is a very good database, okay? So let's see, these are the 10 stocks. Uh, these are all um, NASDAQ stocks, most of them. Um, and uh, they're small stocks because they're, they're, they're all penny stocks because they're cheap, but that's our selection criteria. Um, you see these uh, decimal places up to four places because I have uh, dividend and split adjusted them. So that's why, you know, this is not the raw prices. These are split and dividend adjusted prices, but that's not relevant to our discussion. Okay, so let's look at the, um, the price at the end of that year or the beginning of the next year. You will see that most of these uh, prices are disappeared, NAN, not a number, except for MDM is 0.49. What happened to all these stocks that are so cheap? And what happened one year later? Well, it turns out that all of them disappeared. They, they have been delisted, gone bankrupt or whatnot. And that is not surprising because 2001 was a very bad year for stocks. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, the event of uh, September 11th. We had a bursting of the dot-com, the first dot-com bubble. And uh, so this is a very nasty year. So many of these small, small stocks did not survive that year. Uh, and if you look at their terminal price, what I call terminal price, these are the last traded price of these stocks. You can see that most of them have dropped a lot. So if you bought this portfolio in the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, many of them will have been worth at most this price if you manage to sell it on their last day of trading. If you are present enough to know that the next day they're going to go bankrupt, you would have sold them at this price at, at the last time. But sometimes you may not even get to sell them at that price because you, do, you won't know that it's going to file for bankruptcy the next day. So the return is very bad indeed. Uh, you will see that the return cannot be better than 42%, negative 42%, probably worse because as I said, a lot of this stock would just announce bankruptcy and this immediately saw price jump to zero and you know you won't even get the last price uh, that we shown you. Okay. So very bad strategy, no surprise, right? I mean, this is a crazy, stupid strategy. But what if we backtest this strategy with a database that has survivorship bias? Well, it so turns out that the stock names that we would pick on that database would be quite different, completely different, except for the one symbol, which is MDM, which is the one that survived for that year of 2001. Uh, and in fact, you will see that they you know since they survive until today they of course survive until the beginning of 2002 which is one year later and in fact not only do they survive but a lot of them have greatly improved their value wow look at that this is go from 0.8 to 27 dollars this go from 1 to 3 dollars this one go from 1 to 9 dollars and no surprise there that the portfolio that we pick with a database with survivorship bias has a return of 388%. Uh, this return, of course, is unrealistic because we could not have predicted in the beginning of the year which of these stocks that we pick actually going to survive. So it, 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 this survivorship bias is a, a, another form of look-ahead bias. It is assuming that you know which stocks is going to survive until the beginning of 2002, and that would not be possible. So uh, that's uh, something that uh, oftentimes will plague equity strategy. It doesn't plague any 
future strategy or, or foreign currency strategy, but if you are a stock picker, that's something you have to be very careful of. Um, what's the cure? Well, the cure is essentially one, buy a database that has survivorship, that has no survivorship bias. Nowadays, there are many choices. Techdata.com is a high frequency database. Chris.com, that's a low frequency but very, very expensive uh, database for finance researcher. Um, Keybot.com uh, has high frequency data but also survivorship bias free and I heard it's affordable. CSI data will sell you a delisted stock database which is almost as good as survivorship bias free database. So that can be considered Quando and Quantco uh, are the newer startups that uh, provide such data as well. So, so once you buy it from them, you know, no problem. If you don't want to buy, I'm, I'm, but of course they are going to be more expensive. You know, survivorship bias free database is going to be more expensive than one that has survivorship bias. But if you are stuck with a database that only have the current stocks that do have survivorship bias, well, at least you should only use only the most recent three years for testing, uh, because the shorter the time, the less the problematic is the survivorship bias. So that's uh, something you can try to uh, alleviate by just using most recent data for backtest. And of course, um, if you decide to create your own database and by capturing you know, the, the stock universe, let's say of S&P 500 every day, then after a few years, you would have your own survivorship bias data, uh, survivorship bias free database for your own use. So you have to start collecting your, on your own, basically capturing the point in time uh, prices of all S&P 500 stock today, every day, and that uh, you will be able to use it a few years down the road. Okay, so the final bias uh, that I want to talk about is the data snooping bias. Uh, essentially, it means that the model is too complicated. The model is complexity is greater than data complexity. You have more parameters than there are enough data to 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 support uh, you know optimization. Um, so what that does is that the model is really picking up noise in the data because you know there's not enough data to to ensure that uh, uh, the the model is uh, generalizable, and it's picking up noise and it's picking up patterns that only exist in a you know in that small data set, and it's not pattern that really going to persist into a out of sample data set. So models with data snooping bias has great backtest performance, but have very poor live trading performance or out of sample performance. So there are two sources of complexity typically. Uh, one is uh, simply you have too many parameters uh, you know, to, to, to optimize. But the other, which is more subtle, is that you have too many trading rules. Oftentimes, uh, you know, I even read books about from, from great traders, they would describe the trading rules and it would span two, three pages long. And I would think, well, you know, I wonder if this guy actually used this trading rule to trade himself because, or her, herself, because if the trading rule is so complex, it must work very well in the past, but does it really work in the future? So that's something we have to think about when you see a trading rule that is, gets too complicated, even if there are not too many parameters. Now, what is the cure of data snooping bias? Well, I would say that if you build a model that are based on some well-known financial economic principles, that's greatly reduce the scope of um, data snooping or data mining. Uh, for example, if the, the model is based on um, earnings announcement, uh, it pay, uh, you know, the, the, the momentum driven by earnings announcement or momentum driven by some kind of uh, news, or uh, it's based on the uh, notion of co-integration of uh, similar stocks. Well, these are very easy to understand fundamental principles that are likely to be true uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, for example, you know, as long as two companies are really um, competing in the same business, uh, two airlines or two oil companies, you know, it's just very reasonable to expect that their price, their, their returns would not deviate too, too much from each other. And so you can build a trading strategy based on that observation. And that's not data mining. That's very reasonable. Um, so the rule of thumb, you know, I have I, is that if 
we want to introduce an additional parameter uh, to a model that trades once a day, you better have an extra year of data, you know, to support it. And also, you might, must make sure that, you know, to avoid data snooping bias and to avoid data, uh, to avoid look ahead bias, you have to do sufficient out of sample testing. So you should create your model, um, optimize your parameter and your trading rules only in sample, and then reserve some data you know, it doesn't have to be a lot, half a year, um, one year data that you should not use at all in this strategy development. And then only after you're completely satisfied with your strategy should you try it on the out of sample. Pretend that the out of sample uh, data is live trading uh, situation. And if it completely crumble in the out of sample data, well, you can just fold, fold out this strategy completely. You should not go back and try to optimize it because if you're trying to go back to optimize it so that it works well in the out of sample, well, that's no longer out of sample uh, data. Uh, so, you know, instead of using a fixed in sample data set for the parameter optimization and trading rule optimization, of course, you can also use a uh, look back, a uh, moving look back window. So you will optimize your parameters every day, essentially, in back tests and always using look back data to optimize it. That way uh, might be more realistic because that way would be the way you can run the model in live trading as well. So you don't depend on parameters that are optimized one year ago or two years ago, but you are running a model based on a parameter that have been optimized with the latest data. Well, finally, the best model, of course, is one that doesn't have any parameters. There are very few such models. You can find some. Um, you know, this is possible to find it, but, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 generally speaking, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to find such a model. Uh, you know, at most, at, at least you probably will have one parameter or so. Okay. Um, so, what's the conclusion? Um, let's let me just run through the, 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 the key points uh, that I talk about in terms of backtesting and the pitfalls. Well, you can see that there are many ways that the backtest can go wrong, and most of these ways are unfortunately going to inflate backtest performance, uh, which will uh, you know, make you start trading life without, uh, and lose money in real life. So that's why they are so insidious, these kind of uh, pitfalls. Uh, and to avoid these pitfalls, um, one way you can do is to pick the right backtesting platform uh, that is well designed, that can be used for both backtesting and live trading. Pick the right data set and uh, choose a simple model to start with. Uh, one key fact that we should remember always with backtest is that a backtest cannot really uh, guarantee that your strategy will work in live trading. Even if you didn't have any, if you don't have any of these pitfalls, chances are that uh, there may be a regime change or there may be, um, you know, some subtle overfitting uh, that, uh, you know, is hard to avoid. And, uh, you, you know, there's no guarantee that a good backtest will result in a good uh, uh, live profit. However, at the very least, you can use it to reject a hypothesis that your strategy actually work. So it can be used in a negative way, that is to say, to reject your strategy. And that's uh, not, a, not, no, not, not a bad thing at all, because by rejecting a bad strategy, it saves you from losses. So, and that's very, can be very useful. So that's it. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming to my, to my talk. Um, I welcome you to, uh, you know, ask any questions if you, um, you know, we, we certainly have a few minutes, I think, for, for questions, but please feel free to contact me also through my email uh, blog and uh, Twitter. Um, thank you for your time, and I'll hand it back to uh, Dirk. Thank you very much, Ernie. Um, and we do have two questions. So let's start with Peter. He asks uh, the following questions. Uh, the following question, how would you tackle the problem of price timestamp and actual time of receival during backtest? In real life, they differ. However, in backtest, we usually get the price timestamp and the produced strategy output may be inflated as opposed to real-time behavior. Well, that's an um, uh, issue 
really, well, first of all, that issue uh, only a problem if it's only a problem if your strategy uh, is what one can call uh, seasonal, right? So, for example, a seasonal strategy would be something that, well, it you know you have to enter the trade at uh, 10 o'clock rather than uh, 10:30. Right, so you know your trading signal uh, has a condition which is conditioned on time. Uh, if your strategy, on the other hand, is like a, a mean reverting um, pair trading strategy, then it doesn't matter that uh, the price is, is uh, you know we re mean reverted at 11 as opposed to 11:01. Uh, you know you will just execute at, at at whatever time that the you know at whenever the price is right, irrespective of the time. So if you have a, um, a strategy that does depend on the time uh, for uh, you know your, your trading signal, well, you have to use a uh, you know you, there's there are more things to worry about than just the, the timestamp of historical data. You have to worry about the latency of your trading system. Uh, you know, like uh, if it's that sensitive, you have to find out how you can send your trading signal from your program to your broker and get executed you know within let's say two milliseconds and that's a, you, we are entering into the rhyme of uh, high frequency trading which I think it's um, is a, quite a bit beyond uh, you know what I talk about um, uh, there there are a lot of considerations that we have to figure out with high frequency trading and one of them is like you said uh, the uh, the timestamp of the data, uh, but that's um, that's not the only you know that's not the only issue we have to concern with. There are data in high frequency data that give you two timestamp. You know, one which is when the trade occur, another time is when the um, the data provider receive it. And typically, you can use the timestamp where the data provider receive it because assuming that you have as low a latency as the data provider, which of course, it's not easy to get because the data provider typically um, are co-located at the exchange, so they get the latency within um, not even millisecond. Maybe they get it uh, in uh, in the rhyme of um, uh, microseconds. So, you know, I think the the, the issue of timestamp is the least of our worries when we are getting into that uh, time scale. Okay, um, here is another question, uh, so many more questions. I'm not sure if we can answer or if Ernie can answer all of them, but um, so Andy's asking, uh, does Ernie trade, so do you trade your own account? If so, are you making money? And if you are, um, how do you find the time to write books, um, uh, post online and participate in webinars? Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, this had question has been asked um, uh, many times. <laughs> As the um, uh, yes, I do uh, manage my own money. We we as QTS Capital Management manage over 21 billion. It's not a big firm; it's a small firm. There's only two principal, me and my partner uh, Roger. Uh, we manage a, uh, a commodity pool, essentially a hedge fund that's about 4.5 million in asset. And uh, in addition, we manage about 17 million in uh, client separate client accounts. So yes, we are trading. At, you know, we generate two billion uh, in transaction in, do in U.S. dollars transaction at our broker uh, every month. So we are really quite busy trading. But thank goodness, our strategies are all automated. So the you know, right now is trading uh, around the clock in the various forex markets. That's why I have time to uh, give talks. Um, you know, I also find that um, giving talks and writing books. You know, a, a lot of times when I write a book, it is a way for me to generate new ideas. I find that I can more more effectively generate new ideas when I organize my thinking on paper and have that scrutinized by multiple people. So when I write a book, when it's published, a lot of readers will write me and say, hey, this is wrong, hey, that's wrong, hey, you have a bug there, and uh, and uh, your data is no good, and so forth. I mean, there's so many constructive feedback that you get. You could, it's quite amazing um, you know, how much you can get back from your readers when you write a book. Now, you know, I find it particularly valuable because 
uh, you know, we are a small firm, so we don't have a team of 100 quants sitting there to debate me. Uh, so I rely on the, uh, the general trader population who would uh, give me feedback on, you know, what we are doing and suggest new ideas. So that's, um, that's a virtuous cycle, I find, uh, that uh, while we are at the same time managing money, trading, and uh, communicating ideas uh, with other traders. I, I find that to be a virtuous uh, cycle. Okay. Thanks, Th thanks for uh, answering the question. Um, so Giancarlo, he is asking, what is the best programming language and environment to perform backtesting? Ah, that's um, a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, I'm well prepared <laughs> to answer that question. Um, there are three languages that are very popular. I don't know I should pick the best one, but the three languages that are popular for backtesting are MATLAB, Python, and R. I personally prefer MATLAB because, well, I'm biased because I'm, I started off knowing MATLAB very well, so a anybody uh, who are, uh, you know, have a good at a particular language have a particular prejudice for that language. So MATLAB is nice because I find the user interface to be extremely polished and this customer support to be great. So oftentimes when I try to learn some new technique, let's say um, GARCH for volatility modeling, and I would use the MATLAB toolbox to build some model and I would say, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense. I don't know how to use this, um, this package. Well, if you're using R or Python, you have to be really dependent on the kindness of strangers to answer your question on a uh, forum. With MATLAB, you just need to pick up the phone and someone will answer you. Uh, so that's, uh, that I, I like that kind of um, quick response. You know, you, 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 you don't want to put your question out there and wait for three days be, or, for, or forever before someone will answer your question about how to use a certain toolbox. Um, Python, uh, R is very similar to MATLAB, uh, but it's very slow. Um, and um, the bad thing is very slow and the, the user interface is not as polished. The good thing is that it has a lot more toolboxes and it's free. Now MATLAB is not free, but it's not expensive either. It's 150 bucks, it's just like a copy of Microsoft Excel. Um, but the R is free and it has a lot of toolbox because those toolboxes core packages are contributed by academic researchers. Most academic researchers prefer R uh, because they don't care about performance. So what? It takes three hours to run. We have plenty of time here. Um, so they tend to write extremely sophisticated statistical packages in R and make it available to everybody. Okay, so that's good for R, but you know, not my cup of tea because I need it to result fast and I need customer service. Python is uh, favored by many people and is gaining ascendancy because you can edit Python, debug Python using Visual Studio. So you can have a very polished integrated development environment. Uh, at the same time, it has you can use all of our toolboxes via a package in Python. So you have the maximum possible, um, you know, access to, to, to sophisticated algorithms. Uh, and uh, Python uh, can be compiled into C or C++ or even compiled for parallel processing on a GPU. So it can have a very high performance, but only assuming that you compile it. If you're using the native Python, it is also slow. So Python, I think I would, if I have to pick a language, if you have never done any programming for um, quantitative trading and you have to pick a language, I would say Python might be a best bet. Uh, but, you know, obviously for me, I'm not going to use Python because I'm already very comfortable with uh, MATLAB. So here, here uh, more than um, Ernie, just let me know um, if, you're, if you're running out of time. So Yeah, we can do another uh, five minutes, I think, yeah. Okay. okay, great. So Ranachi here, here uh, is asking regarding survivorship bias for the tickers that went bankrupt. Uh, showed NAN, uh, should we, so none, should we have an entry of zero? Uh, yes, that's a uh, subtle question that I, I kind of uh, touch on. Um, let me go back to survivorship bias. Uh, yeah. It is whether, uh, you know, it is a question of when you can sell it. You know, if uh, you are unable to sell it, 
you know, typically, okay, the quick answer to your, your question is yes, you are right. It should be zero in principle. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you ha somehow are able to sell it on the last day of trading, you know, if, if people say, well, tomorrow is going to pull bank up, guys, and today is the last day you, this stock is being traded, uh, as in the case of a M&A situation instead of a bankruptcy situation, uh, then you will be able to sell it at the terminal price that I displayed earlier. So, but yes, in, in the case of a abrupt bankruptcy like Lehman Brothers, well, no one knows when it's going to go bankrupt uh, necessarily. Uh, so uh, yes, you would get zero in that case. But so that's that's uh, you're right about that. So, oh, here's another question. Ariel is asking, do you recommend a source where to get articles about strategies? Oh, there are many. Um, I have found that lately the best way to get information about strategies is from Twitter. Uh, you have to know who to subscribe to. Uh, you know, you can subscribe to me, but I don't treat too often. But um, there are a number of people who seem to have made it their daily livelihood to treat uh, academic research on strategies. Uh, and uh, if you start with one, you find that uh, you get, uh, you know, you get to know this community of people who just make it their business to share knowledge. These are saints. Uh, in the trading community. I, I, I call them saints. They should be canonized. Um, some websites are also consolidator of uh, trading strategies. Uh, I think one is called Quantocracy. Um, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, well, anyway, you, if you go to my blog, you will uh, often find references to this. If you go to my Twitter feed, you will find references to this. I, I, offhand, I can remember only one uh, which is Contocracy. Uh, Another one is uh, Carl Carey. Uh, he is, um, I think he uh, worked for Bloomberg, but uh, he, he treated maybe 50 tweets a day, and all of which are on academic articles on machine learning, on trading, on finance, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, 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 there's so much information, free information out there, that the only constraint is really time. So, and uh, Neha asks, what is your opinion about technical indicators based algorithms? Your favorite one, if any? Well, technical indicators are a way to summarize certain market truths, right? So, if you believe that a, uh, uh, a price series is um, a uh, momentum type, uh, type of uh, situation, uh, there are technical indicators that would tell you that it's momentum, uh, you know, that would capture that momentum. Uh, if you think that a time series has a mean Vernon character, certain uh, technical indicator would be a, allow you to capture that, uh, in, in summarize that. So they, they, they are pretty uh, handy uh, animals. Um, oftentimes in machine learning, uh, type of algorithm, you would uh, create, you know, 30, 40 different technical indicators and run the machine learning algorithm on them to see which one actually is predictive. So you don't have to stick to just one or two and wonder if they work. You know, just fold a whole lot in and let the machine learning algorithm pick uh, the right one. Okay, so we, we make this the last Last question. Freddie um, asks, uh, how do we incorporate market price impact effect in backtesting? Uh, it's hard uh, to do that um, because there are many ways where a market impact um, can happen. One way is that your order is too big and it, so, uh, quote unquote, walked the order book. You take out several layers of the order book. And uh, for that, in order to backtest that market impact, you have to have level two data, which is extremely difficult to backtest, uh, not for the faint of heart. Um, but uh, if you are saying that uh, you know you remain your order size is smaller than the uh, top of book uh, size quote size, uh, then the market impact is going to be usually uh, quite uh, minimal, right? You, 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 your market order will always get executed at the price of the best bid, uh, best, best bid offer. 
and in that case the market impact is minimal unless you do it too often. So if you continue to send orders, um, you know, every time you get filled, you send another one, then high frequency trader will be able to detect that you are doing that and they will change their votes. So even if you are restricting your order size to the top of book size, if you do it too often, you will generate what is called order flow, and that is detectable, and that will be used to trade against you. So, uh, so that's the two ways uh, that I would mention. Either you walk the ball or you trade too frequently, um, and both of them are quite hard to to exactly pin down unless you're using level two data, uh, or even if you, you you do have access to level two data, uh, it is very hard to uh, to backtest the second effect, which is how people react to your order flow. Uh, but uh, uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's not easy.